Good morning and welcome everybody. It's great to be with you here again on a Saturday morning for our Baba Zoom with Mayor Archive Collective. I think this is the, is the fourth in our installments and really happy to be here to share a little bit about what's going on with Mac and um, talk to some uh, interesting people as well. So today we're going to have three parts. I'm going to have a conversation with Laurent Weichenberger, who is our newest board member. I look forward to uh, chatting with him a little bit is a great new addition to the Mac team. And Heather Mashandaro is going to be showing some recent uh, archival editions as well. And to start with, I'm going to share a little bit about what's happening at the building just as an overview. So Heather Mashandaro is also going to be sharing some new additions to the archive collection. And I'll also have a conversation with our new newest board member, Laurent Weichenberger who is a great addition to the MAC team and look forward to, to talking with him a little bit later. But first, I'm going to start giving an overview, a little bit of what's happened at the building. I'm not sure if everybody on the, on the Zoom today is aware of all of this history. It might be a little bit of a repeat for some of you, but there's a little bit of before and after and some very recent uh, images to give you an idea of, of how things are progressing. So I'm going to move to that right now and uh, share my screen with you. And this is an overview of the, of the building progress. This is a, a artistic rendering of, of the building um, with some landscaping that we are, are hoping this is what it's gonna appear at some point uh, down the road. And uh, of course, if there's gonna be a bus of some kind, it, it has, to be a, has to be a blue one. So th these are images of the building when we purchased it, when it was the Red Oak School, just to give you an idea of the setting and the size of this building, which is, quite substantial, um, sits on six acres of land on, on top of a, a rise. Um, and it was originally a, a school and it was built in 1928. There's a, a plaque that's there inside the building. And at that time, school buildings, courthouses, libraries um, had a uh, real priority in terms of planning and, and budgeting. So the quality of the construction is excellent, so even though it's a 90 year old building all the brickwork that's original and the, the, um, the grouting and all of that is really superb and is still in, in, in very good shape. The architect, um, Ronald Green, was quite a well-known architect at the time, designed an iconic Asheville building called the Jackson Building, as well as a lot of other structures in the area. So it just gives you, gives you an idea of the, uh, the people involved in, in creating this originally. Now I'm just gonna give you a little quick run through of some images. In the beginning, it was more deconstruction than anything else. And a lot of volunteers came and, and helped uh, with a lot of physical labor, uh, literally hauling out wheelbarrows full of debris and filling up many dumpsters um, with what was collected. We also redid the roof on half of the building. You can see here, uh, replacing uh, roofing board and sheathing uh, up high with with a lift and the flat roof over the classroom wing was totally redone and you see Jeannie Felkner and uh, Catherine Dadachanji uh, there in the midst of that. It was quite a group effort. We had quite a crew up there for, for, for some time working on that. Now I'm going to give you a little before and after. Uh, this was one of the stairwells in the condition when we found it needed quite a lot of work. And this is what it looks like today, two different stairwells. On the right, there's brand new windows. All of the walls were replastered, which was a huge undertaking um, that Peter oversaw with, with help from the, the two main guys, Jamie and, and Connor. And Peter said to me that even one of these stairwells, the amount of plastering was more than if you plastered a typical house. There's just a lot, of, a lot of square footage. And one of those things that when you walk into it and see it, you don't really necessarily have any idea of how much time and, and effort has gone into making it look the way it is. Um, here we have a picture of the gym the auditorium on the left, pretty much as it was when when we arrived a little afterwards. Uh, and we are hoping in phase three down the road sometime to turn this into really a professional level uh, performance space for meetings, concerts, events of a variety of kinds. Um, we're working on phase one now, which is going to get us into the second floor and move the archiving activities and library, etc in uh, to the building and uh, later down the road phase three we're going to be redoing the whole auditorium 
Right now on the right, uh, you see its current state. The sheathing on the ceiling was removed in order to identify and repair some damage. And it's full of wood. It's kind of our wood shop recycling place. And uh, as many of you may have already heard, we are reusing everything. Um, and particularly with the recent crazy rise in the price of uh, materials and lumber, this is coming in very handy. The quality of the of the wood and the material in the building is also really superb. They they built things to last with really good materials 90 years ago. So the wood is is uh, that we are reusing is a, is of great quality and we can uh, shape it as we need. So that gives you some idea of what's happening there. Here you see two images of some uh, some work that went on in the building. On the left, you see <clears throat> cutting a new doorway. And we did this in order to divide some of the large classrooms into smaller rooms and needed to have access. So you get a little view of the uh, you get a view of what was involved in cutting through those walls to, to make new doorways. And on the right, that's uh, Jamie uh, cutting up some rebar or pipe of, of some kind in, in the hallway. This is a little again before and after first floor hallway. Um, beautiful or not so beautiful color scheme that was there when we arrived and what it looks like today on the right where the drop ceiling has been removed um, and things have been been cleaned up quite a bit i'm going to show you a few images of the vault storage areas now and what they were before and and the process of of creating them uh, into in, into safe storage areas on the left there you see a bit of a mess this is the midst of the the deconstruction or the, the um, demolition of the of the shower room. And then uh, lower right, that uh, wall dividing it from the room was, was removed. And what you see is the uh, beginning of pouring of the concrete slab. This was six inches of concrete that was uh, put as a, as a flooring uh, on, on the vault there, which was, was quite an undertaking. You see a little bit about the floor. This is before the concrete was poured. Just to get some idea of the of the guts and the structure, those are steel uh, joists, uh, which was a, a more common method some time ago, uh, but a very strong and, and solid method of construction. So this is the archive uh, processing room, and uh, that wall in front of you was was constructed, and through that door is one of the two vaults. So these are fireproof and waterproof. They each have, uh, the two vaults have a dedicated heating, cooling, and also a separate humidification control in order to maintain the proper uh, climactic conditions inside for the, for the stored items. A couple of other images for you, just to show you some of the stuff that's, that's happened behind the scenes. Um, both pictures up in the attic, line sets for the mini splits, and uh, one of the uh, new electrical panels that's gone in. Here's a little image of plumbing. We got Peter on the left and further images of plumbing on the right. Everything you see that's white there is new, uh, new plumbing. And as you may be able to see, there was snaking in and out of those steel joints that I mentioned earlier. So it was quite a, it was quite a feat to get the, the angles and, and everything right amidst, amidst all of that. But we've pretty much redone most of the plumbing in the in the whole building that rough in is all all complete now this is an image of where things are recently um, what you see on the screen here are two rooms and you see the beautiful big tall windows the the quality of light coming in the building is one of its great features and around the the windows um, we've sprayed foam so all the exterior walls around the large windows have a uh, a depth of uh, sprayed in foam insulation for uh, energy efficiency on the, on the whole building. And here we have a very recent photograph just from the last week of sheetrock going up. Uh, Peter and Jamie and Connor uh, lifting up a huge piece of, of sheetrock up on the ceiling in the stairwell and then on the right putting sheetrock in some of the rooms. We're in a, a point right now where we can really see on a a daily, weekly basis, uh, visually, a lot of the changes that are happening, which is quite exciting because a lot of the work previously, um, if you knew what you were looking for, or, or if you're actually working there, 
you knew that hours and hours of hard work was going into it. The casual observer might not notice things that were happening, uh, those important details that had to happen first. But now we're at a point where sheetrock's going up, rooms are starting to look like real rooms, and um, it's quite exciting to, to, see, to see that progress. And now I'd like to, to take a moment to look at a couple of short videos showing you the lift and, or elevator uh, shaft that, that we've constructed. First video shows Peter uh, explaining a little bit about the shaft, which I'm going to have you look at for a couple of minutes. Part of phase one construction is this lift shaft here that has to be done at this point. It has to be enclosed with a one hour fire assembly in the walls. Height from the floor to the ceiling is about 25 feet. The, the lift mast will be mounted on the wall on the right here. That's why we put fire resistant structural wood in there. And this will have a layer of wall board on each side. We're going to do the interior first and finish that. The inspection can be done from around the outside then, up here. And that's that. And now the second short video doesn't have sound, but gives you a little visual of, of what this shaft look what the shaft looks like and you get a little a little sense of of the construction involved. So some little background about this in order to to create this um, quite a lot of work went in a lot of engineering back and forth. Um, this is pouring the concrete footer um, to help support the elevator shaft. And that pipe you see kind of in the center of the picture there going straight up, that support, that's was something that, was, that had previously been used elsewhere in the building and was able to be repurposed for, for, this, for this particular use. So a couple of other images of, of this. This is from inside, uh, off the hallway, looking at the side of the elevator shaft as it was being constructed. The entryway on the left and the beginning of creating the, uh, the enclosure uh, on, on the right. So this lift or elevator is one of the many important components of the building being usable and uh, also accessible. Um, and as many of you know, we're in the midst of, of a fundraising campaign. All of this, everything that we've done, the purchase of the building, um, all of the work that's gone into this project has been absolutely entirely dependent on donations, donations of time, labor, equipment, and of course, uh, financial resources. And I believe we've had over 11 or perhaps now 12,000 hours of volunteer labor that's gone into this, which has enabled us to make great use of the, of the funds that, that we have available. So the elevator is one of those discrete projects, um, and it's part of our current fundraising drive that may, some of you may have heard of. And we've done all the work for the elevator company to come and install. We put all the uh, infrastructure in, in place so it's ready for them to finish the elevator uh, project and have it fully installed. It's going to require an additional $40,000. So that's part of our budget and part of our fundraising. It's a discrete, uh, discrete portion of it. We've already received a grant, generous grant of $10,000 to, to help towards this. So this gives you some idea of, of what we are, we are raising money for, what we're trying to accomplish. This is an image off of the uh, fundraising platform uh, showing some of the material that we have we have preserved and some of the work and the people people working there. So thank you for your attention and uh, for your support in any way that you're in inspired to to help us. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Heather now, who's going to spend a few moments sharing some images and stories about some of the new items in the archival collection. Heather, over to you. Hey, everybody. Um, we just were given Phyllis Frederick's teapot by Ann Giles. So I went over to Elaine Cox's house and I took some photos to share with you today. Ann Giles in the, in the 80s worked for Phyllis Frederick in her archives 
as a gift, Phyllis gave her this teapot and she's had it ever since. And she uses it as a decoration more than uh, a, a useful teapot. So she emailed us recently and asked us if we'd like it. And of course, we said, of course, we would love this. And Phyllis Frederick is somebody very dear to my heart. I was a baby around Phyllis and she was for all intents and purposes, uh, my fairy godmother. And um, I have my, uh, it looks like my mom, Joan, Joan Lee Roe Trammell is on here too. She was very close with Phyllis and she worked on her book, Toys and Games. And my sister, is pictured in that book. She's a little girl holding a teddy bear. And here's a couple of uh, more shots of Elaine holding the teapot. She just unboxed it and we're taking it out and um, looking at it and thinking of Phyllis. And I called Ann uh, Giles recently and she said, um, she said, basically, look at my book, Watertight Rosebud, and I'll just read the passage. After a grueling year of working on my first assignment at IBM, I requested and got a six-month unpaid leave of absence starting in October 1981. Excuse me, I couldn't read this. I plan to spend a month in Los Angeles helping Phyllis Frederick with her archives and another month house sitting for Chris and Christine Pearson and copying Mondeley tapes from Chris's Mayher Lahar archives for another children's book. And that must have been one of the children's books that my mom read to me when I was a child. The name of the book was Marwan. She had to agree to keep total secrecy of the archives so things didn't walk away. Here's, here's uh, the artist on the bottom of the teapot. And just to, in remembrance of Phyllis, this is in 1952 at the Mayher Center in Myrtle Beach, where she met Baba for the first time. Phyllis on, is on the second to the left. She's the tall lady in the sari. Can I make a quick comment on this? Absolutely, go ahead, Laurent. Um, you can see Adele is standing next to Phyllis. They were always together. And Adele told me that when they first met Baba in the lagoon cabin together, he told me that, uh, she told me that he said quite a few things to them. But one of the things that he said was, you two are part of my family. And therefore, you should not have any debt. And he asked them both how much they owed and gave them that amount of money so that they would both be debt free. Just to add a little color there. Wow, that's wonderful. I just want to point out that um, Phyllis Frederick waited, oh, about 10 years to finally meet Baba. And so this, she does have an account of this meeting in The Awakener. And um, this is uh, an article uh, from Lord Mayhair in Glow magazine. And it's, it's, got, it's got the basics of her experience. And it, it's so moving and so beautiful, Phyllis's accounting of uh, her meeting with Baba and making sure that you know, she didn't look at Baba, even though she went to the airport because Baba told them not to look at him at the airport. Laurent, do you remember that story? Adele looked but she decided well, not to look. Yeah, I, re I remember a different story, but there's quite a few about what happened in New York City. Um, so we can mm -hmm. tell lots of stories. Oh, yeah. And then I just wanted to point out this wonderful article by Susan Herr. It's on, it's on uh, the internet. And uh, Susan Herr met Phyllis at Mattel. And Susan... Susan recounts the meeting. Phyllis ran down the stairs, rushed down the stairs and said, oh, you're here. Well, later on, her, Susan found out that uh, Phyllis had seen her from below coming up to uh, the Mattel workspace and knew that she was a, 
a family member, a son in a past life. So she didn't really, uh, she got, she, the puzzle pieces came together later on when Phyllis told her the real story when she, when Phil, when Susan came to Baba. So these two articles are great. And then Memories of 52 by Phyllis Frederick in the Awakener magazine is a beautiful story about Phyllis's first meeting Baba. And I love this first sentence. How did I come to Baba? Somehow, like a stray pebble, I got into his sandal. It's just sweet. The whole article is just so moving. And now I want to feature a painting that Roger Stevens just gave us. It's called Bangalore Baba. And you can see this is when Baba worked with the musts. But uh, Roger did a little bit of um, changing of the background, making it a, a stone background. So if you remember the original picture, it's not quite the same artistic license. But it's rather cute to remember this moment with Baba and the masks. This little passage by Dr. William Donkin is just lovely. Baba works with the masks and the mad in Bangalore, 1939-1940, setting up the Mast Hotel. This hotel was a refreshment booth where the masks would serve, would be served with tea, cigarettes, beaties, and pan. Whenever they asked for them, it was constructed with diligent negligence, everything a trifle awry, with low roof, crooked pillars, and limping tables and benches, and was so planned and executed to make the masts fill themselves in the sort of mean and wretched tea shop that they normally like to frequent. And we showed this flag last in the last Baba Zoom, but I'm bringing it up again because I'm going to feature a little video of Elaine Cox uh, conserving the flag archivally. And just a reminder of Mayor Baba's words on the seven colored flag. Do you know why I suggested a seven colored flag? The seven colors represent the seven planes of consciousness. These colors also represent Sanskara's impressions. The colors in the flag signify man's rise from the grossest of impressions of lust and anger, symbolized by red, to the culmination in the highest state of spirituality and oneness with God, symbolized by the sky blue. I believe Laurent wrote an article in Ohm Point about the colors of the flag. And also my ex-husband, Nicola Mashandaro, he also wrote an article about the colors of the flag. That's correct. If anybody wants it, I can send it to them. And here are some photos by Chris Barker, just to show you the flag in situ. And now I am going to show you a little clip of Elaine Cox, our archivist at home, conserving the flag and also making a box to hold Baba's bath water. This is Baba's flag that used to fly in Upper Maribot, given to Mac by Hetty Johnson and Nick Hawthorne Johnson. It is at Elaine Cox's house and she is preserving it archivally. Elaine is cleaning an old bird dropping stain. This is the last one. See the brush very lightly is uh -huh. rolling up some of the physical. Uh -huh. Elaine is using distilled water and shavings of ivory snow soap. The fiber, it's not very fine, you know, it's a very sturdy uh -huh. weave. Uh -huh. And uh, it's probably 100% cotton in the way that it feels and behaves, but it might have some uh -huh. blend. See, I'm trying to keep the moisture from spreading to the next panel because I worked on uh, some of Baba's jackets. 
But those had been washed by the Mondeli. They had been, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't have things like bird dropping something. Mm -hmm. This is real mm -hmm. serious acidity. What Elaine is doing now is taking out as much water as she can so we don't have a ring around the spot cleaning, you know, when it dries. So take out all the water as possible, as much as possible. All that remains of that stain at this point. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. We are going to mm -hmm. just let it sit with air below it and air above it mm -hmm. on this nice ceramic dish and mm -hmm. let it dry. Mm -hmm. So this is a carpet to cover, cover tube with, with plastic mm -hmm. because that uh, paper mm -hmm. is. Uh, I mean, God knows it's got glues in it. You know, it's a mush, and they they mold it mm -hmm. in like mm -hmm. however they make that. It's 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 paper pulp mm -hmm. with glues, and God mm -hmm. knows what they put in it, and, and set it into the tube. So I lined that with clear plastic, mm -hmm. and then I so that the the uh, fabric will not touch the tube itself. I see. Okay. That fabric, and mm -hmm. that is muslin. Mm -hmm. And then I stitched, I sat and stitched that on. <laughs> wow. By hand, mm -hmm. and tied up the ends. There's mm -hmm. two ends like a mm -hmm. candy bar, mm -hmm. and stuffed them into the hole. Mm -hmm. Here Elaine shows off her immaculate stitching. And here's a close-up. Now we're getting ready to roll the flag up and preserve it archivally and keep it very smooth. Elaine folds the original stitching and smooths down the fabric as she rolls it up. If you were going to display it, you would have to do a little bit of needlework to you can't really repair this flag, but you can um, stitch them down so that those flaps don't, mm -hmm. if you want to display it. It might be laid out on a board, like a really big piece of plywood, huge piece of plywood that's painted and then covered with fabric. Mm -hmm. And the fabric would help hold it in place anyway. Mm -hmm. And tilted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people could see it better. But the fabric would hold this in place at the top. And I think you could probably maybe take a few little light stitches to be removed when you don't display it. Mm -hmm. No such thing as tape is ever coming near it. So <laughs> that can't happen. Okay. And now we're seeing Elaine's Coraplast box. This box will hold Baba's bath water. Baba's bath water is contained in a blue bottle and it was part of the Dorothy Cassidy collection that came to us upon her death. It's sealed against uh, air. There's no mm -hmm. air passing. So you sealed it with just regular beeswax? Yes. Okay. Beeswax. I figured this out mathematically. There's one eighth inch here, one eighth inch here, and one eighth inch. Okay. So that it moves, mm -hmm. but it's never mm -hmm. going to. Mm -hmm. And this is a double wall. Mm -hmm. I wanted mm -hmm. you to get the double wall here. Yeah. This is a box within a box that exactly fits. <laughs> this is, this coroplast has ribs in it. Mm -hmm. And wherever you fold these ribs is where it's very, very strong. Mm -hmm. So the inside box is folded laterally. The ribs run laterally for strength. And the outside, as you can see, the ribs are up and down. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it has double That's strength. That's particular. Mm -hmm. Even if there's an earthquake and this lands on the floor, the bottle should not break. Mm -hmm ever. And then this lid fits inside. And here you can see the double wall of the box itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this lid has no way of, of keeping it closed or fastening it. 
not with the um, screw sets that I use now. Mm -hmm. I may find something in the future, but that mm -hmm. is why this box fits in the core of this box with those bracing it. Mm -hmm. And this lid fits exactly on top mm -hmm. to keep this closed. So this box will be totally finished when I get one of those things where you pull the string and wrap it around. Okay. And then this, even if it's dropped, will mm -hmm. not. You might bend a corner, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. but I don't think that glass will break. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful box, Elaine. How long did it take you to make? A week. Wow. Well, it's well, two the and that's just this part. The, mm -hmm. the double box took me another week, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. probably, but that was done first. Down to the eighth of an inch specification. One box to the other, yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and inside, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted, I didn't want it to be jammed in there rigidly. Mm -hmm. The more slight movement, the, the better it will survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It takes up some of the energy of a, of a, a drop. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. of the energy is taken up by the movement, and then this is wonderful material. Mm -hmm. Once it's folded, these folds, it's unbelievably strong, and it's the weight of air. Mm -hmm. Wow. And Congratulations. it doesn't outgas. <laughs> it's yes. a work of art in it of itself. Yeah, it's the choroplast. It's just marvelous stuff. I love it. And this is where it's folded across the ribs mm -hmm. and these are constantly fighting to mm -hmm. be straight again mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. to train them mm -hmm. for storage I, right. I band them like this so that, also, that's double packing tape right yeah it's tape on tape mm -hmm. and there you have it everyone that's Elaine Cox's beautiful conservation work All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Scott and Laurent. All right. Thank you, Heather. And uh, nice to see uh, Elaine demonstrating her work. I know one of her specialties is, is box making of, of all sorts of shapes and sizes. Got a little, a little sense of, of, of her handiwork there. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to have a conversation with, with you, Laurent, and uh, as you fairly recently joined the, the Mac board, which has been a, 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 a great addition to what we're trying to do. And want to talk to you about a number of things and just start off with asking you a little bit about what, what drew you to, to this project? What, why was it attractive to you to get, get involved with it? It's a great question. Can you hear me okay, Scott? I can. Um, you know, Don and Baba drilled into us about honesty. So I'm, I'm not going to make up some sort of uh, overly flowery story. I think what really happened was I was bequeathed an item of Baba's and I'd never had that happen to me before um, in quite that way. Um, I'm, I'd be happy to talk about that. And then I moved to Asheville. So the two things coincided and then I got to know you better and some of the other board members. We started talking about what's going on there. And it seemed like a great fit um, in terms of people for me. And in terms of the project, um, i had been on boards before. I've, ha I've had some experience with nonprofits in New York and um, Mayor Baba boards and Mayor Baba centers. So I felt like the, it was like a confluence of issues that all just sort of came together. And then you and I talked and, and you know, felt right. Good, right. Yeah. I know in, in hearing some of our conversations and some of the talks that, that you've recorded, um, recall that in one of the ways that you got connected with, with Don Stevens was out of a, you're sharing the, the urgency or the desire for this, his story uh, to be, to be recorded, to be written down, um, and uh, got drafted by Don to be the one to to do that. But I just wanted yeah. to hear, share a little bit about that, and and your thoughts on the importance of of preserving these kinds of records. 
Yeah, a little slight correction to that story, just so that since we're being recorded, I want it to be uh, properly uh, Please preserved. Do, okay. um, but that's not exactly how it happened. What happened was I was asked by Ann Conlon to write a rewrite of God in a Pill, Mayor Baba's drug message. And when I was working on God in a Pill, the rewrite, which became a mirage will never quench your thirst, there was a story of Mayor Baba and Don talking about drugs. So I wrote that story up in the book. And before we went to publication, I thought, well, I better check with Don. I mean, he's still alive. We might as well get, um, you know, at least a validation or, you know, accuracy check on this story. So I wrote to Don. I had never met him, never written to him before. And he was so happy that I had reached out to him to validate the story. He said, most people don't do that. They don't double check. So he, he helped me edit the story and make it even more accurate. And at the end of that process, which took a number of days, I said, I happen to know you have not written an autobiography. And if you should leave this world without having recorded the stories of your life with Baba, the world would be uh, you know, at a loss of some incredible wisdom of your life with Baba and your understanding and, and things that you experienced with Baba, what he said and did. And so I said, if you're not interested in an autobiography, I would say I would help you and I would write your biography if you would like. And he said, no, I'm not interested in any of that. And then about a few months later, a long story short, but a few months later, he wrote to people all over the world that I would be writing his biography. So he changed his heart. He changed his mind. And that's how I got involved with that project. Right. Thanks for, for, for clarifying the, uh, those details. Yeah, so one of the things I, I, I would like to respond to that you said is um, you know, preserving these stories. I, I've seen a, a bunch of things happen over the years, mm -hmm. um, especially hanging out in Myrtle Beach at the Mayor Spiritual Center. People take little bits of stories from Baba's life and then they, they weave them together and, and make up a new story. Um, like one of the famous ones is that Baba said um, he would return in 700 years as a Japanese scientist. That's just, that's make-believe, that's made up. What happened was he said, um, I won't go to Japan this time, but in 700 years, I'll visit Japan. He did say that. He said he would visit Japan. And then he said, when he comes again in 700 years, he'll be trained as a scientist. That's, what, that's one thing he said. Those are both interesting points, but then to conflate that into uh, being a Japanese scientist and all. It's like, what? Uh, anyway, so I think one of the important things is to get it right. Um, Carl Ernst is a great scholar of Islam. He gave a talk to us about the Hadith, which is the um, stories of the words and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. And Carl said they went through great pains to, for every story to say who heard it first from the prophet, how that was passed down, and the entire lineage of the story until we, we got it today. So, for example, it would be like Baba said to Erich, and Erich said to you know, Gary Kleiner, and Gary Kleiner said to Scott Tower, and Scott Tower said the story. So that you get the entire lineage of who heard it and how they heard it and all that. And we, in the Mayor Baba community, of course, we could be much more careful about how we record these stories, the lineage of these stories, the accuracy, the veracity, and we need to do that more and more. I saw one person put, published a quote of Baba's. It wasn't even Mayor Baba. It was a quote that they liked from another spiritual master, and they put Mayor Baba's name on it because they liked the quote. And things like this go on, and it's, it's becoming more and more scary uh, to me, you know? Another thing I saw happen was in India, I, was, I got an English language newspaper in the 80s and I was reading it. It was an article by uh, Rajneesh. Remember, Rajneesh became Osho and all this. Right. I'm reading this article by him. He was still alive. Rajneesh was still alive. And I come upon a whole paragraph and it's Mayor Baba. I can recognize that it's Mayor Baba from the discourses. But he just plagiarized it and put it as his own words. So it's, there's a lot of muddiness and confusion. And I think in the next 700 years, it's important to preserve the accurate words and deeds of Mayor Baba. 
Yeah. And obviously artifacts, which which we can share more about when, whenever you want. Mm -hmm. Well, the importance of stories is something we've talked quite a bit about. And, you know, also the fact that the people that have firsthand stories are dwindling in number. And then we have stories of people, you know, stories of our contact with the Mondali, which are also going to become um, things that have to be recorded or, rem or remembered. So the whole, the whole process of, of doing that is, is, is really important. Yeah. When Can I make a point about that for a sec? Yeah, go ahead. While I was in London working with Don on his biography, he handed me a box. Hmm. Well, I got a number of boxes from him, but one of the boxes was reel to reel tapes. Hmm. And we, so we went through a whole process of preserving the reel to reel tapes that had to be baked. And then we started um, remastering them from the reel to reel to CD ROMs. I have them here in Asheville. But you know, I was listening to some of it, and it's it's Erich telling stories that became the book. Um, Is that so? No, the New Life book. Um, stories of the New Life. Tales Tales from the yeah, New Life yeah, with yeah, Baba. Yeah. And so, you know, there's lots of different stories. It's not just that. And so, tape after tape after tape that that had been made of Erich and Mondeley Hall, or this one, or that one. And so there's so much material that we have in this advent. How are we going to properly preserve it? Is is it's a monumental task. And so I'm definitely interested in that um, more and more as I get older. You know, I think to myself, who's going to want this real to real tape of Erich and Mondeley Hall? And what are we going to do with it? Well, the Mac has a perfect answer to that question. Yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly, we have lots and lots of of recordings in real to real. Is uh, you know obviously older, um, more easy to degrade, cassette tapes, all these we think we've been given by now, I don't know, four or 500 cassette tapes, uh, mostly of Mondeley talks. And so that's, you know, the monumental, a monumental job to, to digitize, uh, transcribe and, and all of that. Um, oh, and then I should add, if, if we're going down this path, a couple of them um, that I was given is Mayor Baba in the barn in 1956. So we have that, that recording where the Mondali are translating his gestures and you can obviously feel Baba's presence in that. Another one is a press conference where the press are asking Mayor Baba questions. Hmm. I believe it's in New York, but I have that. So, you know, what do you do with all this and, and, and who wants to hear it? I think that's gonna be a great, great next chapter in the Mayor Baba community. Yeah, indeed. One of the things that, that's connected to to story, and I, I have heard you talk about this as well. I'm interested in your your thoughts. One of the things that that Baba emphasized so much was the importance of remembrance. Remember me, and wondering if you have any particular reflections or or thoughts on on that theme. Oh, absolutely. So it's one of my favorite quotes of all time: "Is remember me." and I am with you, and my love will guide you. And so to me, uh, I, I, whenever I, I share about Baba with people, I, I try to get into this place of, you know, there's the historical Mayor Baba on, on the left. I'll say on the left because it's the past. It's the man. It's the, the one who's buried in the Samadhi at, at Maribad. And I, and I love the man, and I love his life, and I love everything about him. And there's the Mayor Baba in the present moment, where he said he resides in the hearts of his lovers. And then there's whatever is going to happen. But for me, the whole key of, you know, remember me and I am with you and my love will guide you is that's, that's for right now. That's for the present moment. That's for finding Baba many times a day, as often as I can remember him and being guided, not by my ego, but being guided by him within. That's for me, the real spiritual path. Not so much the, it's great to hang the, I've got pictures of Bob all around, paintings all around. I've got books on my shelf about Baba, but hanging pictures and putting books on the shelf with Baba as the author isn't the spiritual path. Remembering Baba and being open to his guidance in every moment, whether it's because of, you know, who I'm interacting with at the supermarket and the cash register um, person who's ringing me up or my son or 
my wife or people at work, whatever it is, Baba uh, can be brought in. Like you said, anything can be made spiritual. It's not just for some sanctimonious, somber, you know, occasion or sitting in a temple or anything. Any, any day, any moment can be spiritualized, I believe, through remembering him and being open to what he's bringing to that moment. Mm. It could be, like he said in the discourses, it could be a smile that somebody receives from you that could change their day. It could be the, the greatest service is to give a smile. He said that. It's incredible. But uh, without remembrance, I don't know how we get closer to him. Mm -hmm. What about your thoughts on what will help engender remembrance for, for people going forward? Hmm. You know, that's a really tough one. Um, I, so I, I get, uh, I'm kind of torn on this answer because I don't want to bring up a lot of things that are fearful or all that. And, and I, th I think Baba didn't like that approach either. But what I, what I see in the world right now is there's a tremendous amount of Maya. And when I say that, there's the, there's the war in you know, Ukraine where I'm just mind blown that Russia could even behave the way they are. And I know we're not supposed to talk politics, but I'm just saying there's, there's the Maya of what's going on in the world, lust, greed, anger. There's the Maya within, right? So it's not all externalized. There's internalized Maya also. And then there's the internalized, you know, what we call the whim from Mayor Baba, uh, which is the urge to move closer to the truth, closer to Baba, closer to who I really am. And then there's Baba in, in my heart as, as the real me. So for me, I think um, in my life, I don't want to talk about what other people should do. I just want to make it personal, you know, using I language. I want to show up for Baba and myself and my family and my friends as the best version of me that I can be of service to Baba. Mm -hmm. Love, obey, surrender to Baba. So for me, remembrance and the why of remembrance has to do with how can I be of more service to Baba and how can I show up as a better version of myself? And ultimately, selfishly, I wanna be closer to him, to be with him in, in real ways. Um, I, I joke about this sometimes that when I die, I don't wanna float up to Baba heaven and he goes like, what the heck? What kind of lifetime was that? You call that a lifetime? I want him to, you know, pat me on the back and say, attaboy, good job, and, and you know, let's do that again. So, you know, what, what are the real ways I can show up? Not, not superficial ways, not myopic ways, but ways that Baba would appreciate. I don't know, that may sound childlike, but that's how I feel. No. Childlike, <clears throat> childlike's often the best, the best path in the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is my real father, I can assure you. Mayor Bob is my real father. Yeah, good. I know you, you spent quite a lot of time, um, you know, quite a rich Baba life and story, and quite a lot of time with <clears throat> with Don Stevens. And wondering if you could share a bit about what, what you feel was sort of one of the most important things you got out of that long relationship. Wow, that's a tough one. Uh, I, I would have to do like a top three or something like that because top, top I, I, don't think I, could, I don't think I could I don't think I could on the spot come up with the, the most important one but this I'll say right off the bat um, you know Don was super honest and candid and he got in trouble a lot with Baba I don't know most people don't know that but he would say and do things where Baba would just be like what you know <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about and so but that kind of casual free style with Baba. Apparently Baba loved it, loved Don, and Don was just himself. He didn't pretend to be anything but himself. So one of the things Don said early on in my relationship with him, and, and this is paramount to me, he said, you know, um, you hear stories that Baba gave people orders and all this, and you know, that he was a spiritual master. And he said, you know, he said, in my experience, it wasn't quite like that. And he called me Little Bear um, while we were working together. He said, Little Bear, it was more like this. Baba never forced himself 
into any aspect of your life. He was incredibly patient and he waited for you to invite him in to any aspect of your life. And only then would he deal with that part of you in that part of your life. And he said, so in my case, he said, meaning Don, in Don's case, he said, in my case, I kept two things away from Baba as long as I could. One was my finances and the other was my sex life. And he said, until I had made such a mess of both of them that I, I had to bring them to Bob and say, I need your help on this. And he said, and then when I did, there was no sheen. There was no, God, it took you so long, Don. There was nothing like that. They just, he said, they, we just immediately dealt with both in a very beautiful, graceful, loving way. So I think that's fascinating. So he said, it wasn't that, you know, I'm ordering you to do this and, and, you know, uh, it wasn't telling in Don's case anyway, it was more of a, of a, there was a mutual respect and they were human with each other. And like he said, Baba waited to be invited in. And when I heard that, it really deeply touched my heart, like profoundly, it still does today, that Baba had that kind of, it was like um, grace mixed with patience, mixed with total love and compassion and no judgment. So that was a big one for me. Um, it seemed to be like another chapter of my journey with Baba beyond the books, because I never met Mayor Baba. I, I came to Baba in 86. Beyond books and videos and, and stories was this a deeper sense of the reality of Mayor Baba as a man with other people. Um, the second, I think, is Don put a lot of emphasis on the need to balance the mind and the heart. And so um, he didn't make that up. Don didn't make that up. It came from Baba himself. And so one of the things Baba said about Don, he said many things, but he said, Don has an almost perfect balance of mind and heart. And so Baba stressed that to Don, the balancing. He put, Baba put it in God Speaks right before the actual text of God Speaks is a little paragraph. He talks about balancing mind and heart in there. In the discourse, the avenues to understanding, he talks a lot about the balance of mind and heart in there. And the more you look for it, the more you can find Baba talking about balancing mind and heart. And so I, I said to Don in London, I, I really don't know how you do that. How do you how do you balance the mind and the heart? And he said, Well, little bear, okay, let's say you're in a situation, and before you react to that because we all know that reaction and the ego is usually what is the knee jerk. He says, before you react, slow it down and ask your feelings, your heart, how do you feel about this situation? And then still don't react, but ask your mind, and what do you think about this situation? And in that place, of slowing it down. He called this, by the way, this, this place he called the neutral plateau. But um, he said, and in that, come up with a, a response that honors both. And I, I've been trying to practice this uh, more and more, but it's a difficult thing because it kind of declaws and defangs the ego reaction if you can slow it down. And it's quite difficult to do in a, especially in a charged situation where there's emotions and the person you're interacting with may not have that much time and patience for your process. And nonetheless, it's, it's, I feel it's my responsibility <laughs> to, to embrace my own needs in that situation. So if I need a little bit of time, what's the hurry? I can say, hang on a sec, I need a little, I need a moment to process here you know, and not let the ego just hit the gas pedal and away we go. Laurent, I, that just uh, brings to mind, mind sped up is mad, mind slowed down is must, yep. mind stopped is God. And um, also, there's one more, there's one more. Tell me. Mind, mind working is man. 
Oh, okay. Thanks. Thanks. This is this you're preserving the real words. And well, uh, it reminds me of uh, Jeff Wolverton's story about Adi K. Arani. The first time he saw Adi K. Arani, he saw him from behind and he just had an intuitive knowing that that person over there sitting there in the original kitchen has stopped. That person is, has stopped. That's his was his intuitive knowing voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and and to to f finish off what Scott was asking, there's one more thing, I think, and that's the. It's all related to what you're, what we're hearing here, but it's about the new life, and I, it's a very 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 long story. But I'll just give the very tail end of this story. At the very tail end of this story, Erich finally says to Don, all right, Don, I'll tell you what you've been asking me for years to tell, the story of what it was like to be with Baba on the new life. Don had been pestering Erich to tell this, and it became the book, Tales from the New Life. But in any case, what's not in that book, Tales from the New Life, is what happened after it was all recorded and done. And Erich you know, had them turn off the tape and said, well, Don, now that you've heard the story, you know, what do you think? How do you feel about that story? And Don said, and this is like I said, Don would get in trouble. This is one of those Don get in, gets in trouble stories. Don said, well, I just, I can't believe it. It's, it's, it's so unbelievable what you had to endure and the hardship. And I just don't know how you did it. I don't know how you got through it. And Eric said, well, Don, then I failed you. And Don, you know, was, no, no, I, I didn't mean that. I, no, that was wonderful. And no, Eric said, no, Don, then I failed you because I have failed to communicate to you the glory of companionship with Meher Baba, the avatar of the age. And I did not experience it as hardship and suffering. I experienced the glory of companionship with Baba. And when I heard that, I thought, oh my God. And so Don was set straight. It's a beautiful story of how Don would get into trouble like that. But then the, the result is so beautiful that it's it's that that day daily life with Mayor Baba which can be right now, that new life with Baba can be right now, that daily life with Mayor Baba as the constant companion and the com companionship with the avatar is, is the apex. It's the highest. And so Don, when he heard that story, it shifted his entire life of how he related to Baba. And so, yeah, we, we went around and did um, seminars and wrote books, but I asked him one day, like, why are we even doing this, Don? I guess I was getting in trouble with him. I said, what, what, what are we doing? And he said, we're going about my father's business. That's what he said. And so it was that kind of, you know, what do you do each day? What do you do with Baba? I've heard so many people say to me, what, what do you do at the Mayer Spiritual Center? Or what do you do when you get there? And, and I don't know what to say. So like many Baba lovers, I, I make up something. I say, well, as little as possible. That's my answer. As little as possible. And they say, what do, you, well, what do you mean by that? I say, well, it's not about doing. I try to be with Baba. Try to, to learn more about surrendering to Baba. To, it's not about what needs to be done. It's, it's about getting closer to him within. He's the real me. So how, what, how do you do that? It's about surrender. It's about love. It's about obedience. I don't know what else it's about. There's forgiveness sometimes is necessary, but it's not about doing so much. I don't know if that answered your question. I think I'm rambling a little here, but that's how I feel. No, it's great. Great answers. Thank you. Always great to hear where, where, where you take things. I recall one of the things that you mentioned in terms of ask the head, ask the heart, and that that challenge and that, that dance. Um, and one, if you could say a little bit about the connection with that and what, what Baba had to say about honesty. 
I think you and Don talked oh, about. Oh boy, that's a, that's a really important one, Scott. Um, so many people may not have heard this story, so I'm gonna try to do it justice, Scott, because you're asking a very important question. And this is not one I think should be um, skipped over lightly. So what happened was, um, as many people know, Don was a Sufi under Murshid Arabia Martin, and then she passed away um, before she could meet Baba physically, but she had an internal experience of Baba's divinity. So Rabia Martin had dedicated her entire order to Meher Baba and herself to Meher Baba. Uh, sight unseen, she had never met Meher Baba physically, but she was able to get the whole order under Meher Baba before she passed away from cancer. Right after that, um, she had named Mershida Deuce as her successor. And right after that, Mershida Deuce and Don Stevens met Mayor Baba in 1952. And so the Baba, not just did he, he reorient Sufism, he rewrote their whole order, he just from, from the ground up. Um, he stopped a lot of things they were doing. He gave them new things to do. It was a, it was a, it's like what's going on with that Mac building. You got to tear things down sometimes before you build them up again. He did a lot of tearing down and then rebuilding with Sufism. And one of the things that he added as a major pillar of Sufism was absolute honesty. 100% absolute honesty. And Don said, you know, there were a lot of things that Baba put in the charter. Uh, no sex outside of marriage, financial stability and paying off your debts. He said, the sex and the money was nothing compared to the honesty. The Sufis were going nuts about, well, what does he mean absolutely honest? They would come to Don because he was a preceptor. And the Sufis would say, Don, if, we're, if, if I'm absolutely honest with my wife, she'll divorce me. Or they say, if I'm absolutely honest with my boss, I'll get I'll get fired. How how can we be absolutely honest? <laughs> so Don Don went to Bob and said, Bob, you're gonna have to help us with this honesty bit because they're getting they're getting nervous about what this means. That was the big one that Baba had to clarify. So of course Baba comes uh, to America in '52, and he and he clarifies it. But it's a, it's a long clarification, so bear with me for a couple more minutes on this. Baba said, okay, you've been asking for clarification. And I'm paraphrasing, but this is the gist of what Don told me Baba said. And I heard this story so many times from Don. I think I got it right. But he said, <laughs> paraphrasing, he said, you've been asking me to clarify about honesty. So here's what honesty means to Baba for the Sufis. This is the, the context that it was in. He said, now you're in a situation and you're called upon to respond. He said, there, there's a possibility that you are required to give everything you know about that situation. He said, but that's rare. Mostly you're not, you don't need to tell everything you know. That's a rare case. He said, on the other side, there could be a case where you feel you shouldn't say anything at all about what you know, zero. And he said, but that's also rare. So um, not speaking at all, being entirely silent about what you know is not being dishonest. But it's rare that you're actually in that situation. And he said, telling everything also is not, dishonest, but it's rare that you are really called upon to, to tell everything you know. So he said, let's talk about the rest. The rest is more than nothing and something less than everything you know. And he said, you have to determine in the situation how much of what you know the other person or people have the right to know. You have to determine that. Or in other words, how much of it can they make use of? How much of it is really for them in the situation? He said, this is not an easy thing, but it's on you to determine that first. Once you understand that, let's say of everything you know about the situation, you're gonna tell them 70% of it. He, and I'm making up this number. I don't know what, what number Baba used, but I'm just giving an example. 
let's say you decide you're going to share 70 percent of what you know well that's not the end of it either because in all of what you know some of it is is going to be perceived by the listener as positive you know this and some of it will be perceived by them as negative and you know that as well so in that which you decide to share if you only share the positive well that's dishonest and there if you only share the negative and you leave out the positive well that's also dishonest so what does it mean not that you give a 50 50 equal amount of positive and negative you said no 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 but in that original understanding that you had the proportion of positive and negative that you know is in that situation you need to properly reflect that in what you give to the person does this make sense what, how i'm trying to explain this it's a very difficult thing to even talk about let alone to live up to but he said now when you share you're sharing the amount of information that you feel they are entitled to or can make use of or is really for them and it's the right proportion of po positive and negative and not spun to be more positive or to be more negative it's really an honest assessment of the situation he said that's what i mean by honesty <laughs> and so don said wow he i think nobody had ever heard a version of honesty like this before but they were all very impressed and this was doable. This was practical spirituality. And Don, Don was asked by Baba to take a vow of honesty twice. Once as a Sufi. And then again, Baba said, I want you to practice this at work at Chevron, where he was an executive in big oil. He said, I want you to be 100% honest at work. Would you do that? And Don said, OK. He knew that it would be difficult. And then Baba would check on him and say, are you allowed to be 100% honest at work? Is your boss allowing you to live like that? And it, it turned out he was able to. All the details are in the book I wrote, um, An Almost Perfect Balance, which is Don's authorized biography. But incredible stories. Wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, it's always a, it's a pleasure to have a chat with you and a pleasure to, to share that with with uh, the rest of the people in the room as, as it were really always uh, enlightening and uplifting and I think you know one of the things that I think that that Bob is asking of us is you know the, the important thing is how do you live your life not you know not not if you do this or that ritual but how how is it that that you you embody him and what he's taught us in in our lives and I just I want to say I, I I can see and appreciate your efforts to do that and uh, you know have how you're living your life be be a service to him and and also perhaps an inspiration to to others. So thank, thank you. you, thank you. Do so I have like, a minute? One thing before we close off. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna move open for questions in a minute. So if you go, go ahead, if you want to add something now. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, just quick. So I brought this as a show and tell. Uh -huh. Can you see this? Yeah. So I won't I won't belabor it, but I'll just let you know. Um, Don gave me something with conditions. He was very intentional and kind of conditional. And this is Meher Baba's electric shaver. <laughs> um, what had happened is it's inside the box, but what had happened is Baba, you know, shaved all his life. I don't think there's ever a time that Baba didn't shave, except one picture I know where he's got a very long beard. But I mean, Baba basically shaved throughout his entire life. And so at some point, Don told me that Baba said, Hey, um, I heard that they came out with an electric shaver. And Don said, Yeah, that's right. And Baba said, well, when you're back in the West, do you think you could pick me up an electric shaver? And Don said, yeah, of course. So next time he came back to see Baba, he brought him that shaver. And Baba used it for years until his passing. And then 
after Baba was entombed and Don returned to India, Erich said, you know, that shaver you got for Baba? And Don said, yeah, what about it? And Erich said, well, after Baba was passing, they gave it to me, but it really should go back to you. You're the one who bought it for Baba. So Erich gave it back to Don. And then before I left England under conditions, uh, Don gave it to me. Uh, one of the conditions, which I really do want to share, and then we can move on to questions is, he said to me, little bear, don't let them put it under glass. That's exactly what he said. I knew exactly what he meant also. He wanted people to be able to hold it, touch it, experience it without it being a museum piece, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. So that, that posed a real question in my mind, like do I just bequeath it to somebody else or could I, could I work with an archive to have conditions like that? Uh, anyway, interesting story. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Laurent, you certainly can bequeath anything to Mac with conditions. Okay, thank you. I see. I have a little. I would add something to the story about that. Uh, what is it called, Laurent? Could you show it again? What is that called? It's not a razor. It's electric shaver, right? Shaver. It's the same thing. It, I've, I've been wondering it's what became of it. Oh, that's a picture of it. That's the box it came in. Is that right? Yes, it's cool. inside of the box. It's, it's inside that's the box. The box of, that's the box of the shaver Baba used that, that Don gave Baba. Is that correct? Yes, and it's inside this box. So if you come to my house. Yeah. Well, I don't remember the year, but it would have been probably 72, 3, 4, 5. At, during Amartiti, you know, Erich would stay up all night telling stories. And somehow there was a moment when the trust, the Mondelez car was going back to Marizad from Marabad during Amartiti, quite early in the morning, about the crack of dawn, Erich decided to go back to Marizad and, and bathe. And I don't know what it was. He asked me if I'd like to go also. So I, I accompanied him. And Erich said, now, there's just one of these houses at Subal for bathing, you bathe first. And he said, don't take long because people are coming for a tour for Darshan here at Marizad. Groups of Indian Baba lovers from Marabad are coming here on a bus and we have to be ready for them. So like a fool, so he says, be fast. He says, you know how Baba gave baths fast. So I felt like it took me ever in there to take that. And I, and I felt like I had overstayed it and maybe ruined Erich's opportunity to bathe. Well, I got out and I was bathing and I, I was down there near those baths and outhouses. And he was down close to his room. And he walked towards me a step or two from his room and held up an electric shaver and he said ralph this is baba's electric shaver would you like to have it and like all of a sudden i was overwhelmed with the moment of extreme practicality that my lifestyle was not proper that i'd be afraid something would happen to it and i said no <laughs> just like that a fool I didn't say any reasons or anything I said I just shook my head because he was what maybe 20 30 40 yards from me I just indicated no and he put it back in his room and I thought am I crazy anybody would give their life your soul 
to have that razor. And I knew what it meant, but I knew that I shouldn't be possessing it, that it, that it was a value to me more if, and then I, now you tell me, today I learned that Eric gave it back to Don and Don has given it to you. I think that's one, Jay Bob. Thank that you. is amazing. That is definitely a, a taste of Baba's serendipity. Perfect serendipity that you would be on this call listening to the story uh, about the razor. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all for, for joining us. Thank you, Laurent, for, for sharing your thoughts and stories. To Heather for showing us the, the uh, little update on some of the artifacts. And look forward to seeing you elsewhere and again here next month. So, Jay Baba, everybody. Jay Baba, everyone. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Thank Jay you for joining us Jay today. Jay Avatar Meher Baba. Okay.